Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our CBD webinar organized by Government Medical Officers Association and Society Health Research and Innovation. We are glad to inform that to each participant of the CPD webinar will be receiving an e-certificate for their participation. Please stay with us until the end of the session. We will be releasing the link to the chat box. Let's move on to today's topic, tackling a skin rash. Where can you go wrong? To avoid interaction during this lecture, kindly mute your microphone and turn off the camera. Use the chat box to clear your doubts and at the end of the session. We are pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Indra Kahavita, consultant dermatologist, anti-leprosy campaign of Sri Lanka. She's the chairperson of leprosy study group, Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. She has co-authored three books and guidelines on leprosy published by the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. Also, she has several national and international publications on leprosy and leishmaniasis. Her areas of interest, leprosy and leishmaniasis. Madam, thank you very much for joining with us today. And over to you, Madam. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, in the next hour or so, we are going to uh, look at a few conditions where uh, a patient presenting with a skin rash, uh, how we will discuss how to uh, tackle that rash and to avoid pitfalls. So before I begin, I would like you to know a few things like Say, if you have a patient with a skin rash, what are the things you should do uh, to make sure that you avoid uh, coming to a wrong diagnosis and also to make sure that you don't do any harm to the patient? So when you see a skin rash, when you see a patient with a skin rash, there are a few things you can think about uh, to come to a uh, diagnosis or to tackle this rash. The first thing is, uh, like, think about the patient's age, sex, uh, and whether the rash has been there since birth. Is it something congenital? Is it something acquired? Is it an infection? Is it inflammatory? And if it is a nodular lesion or a, or a tumor-like lesion, is it benign or is it malignant? Uh, when you get a rash, especially in, in inflammatory rashes, is it acute or chronic? So when you think about those things, and I, I think out of all these, the most important thing to uh, think of is, is it inflammatory or is it infective? Because nowadays, a lot of doctors think, okay, even... It doesn't matter even if I can't come to a diagnosis because there are these combinations which will cover everything. We have these triple combinations which, which uh, are supposed to contain uh, anti-inflammatory, antifungal and antibiotic properties. So a lot of doctors think that, okay, I can give this, this will cover everything, so I should be okay. But the problem is most of these combinations, they contain a very strong steroid. And that uh, is the thing that works best. So whatever the rash, you will be treating that rash with the steroid. So my uh, suggestion is, don't try to do this. If you are not sure whether it's an infection or an inflammatory lesion, treat the infection first. If it is not getting better only, think about treating the inflammatory lesion. So in my presentation, uh, you all must have gone through the uh, four uh, pre-test questionnaires I, questions I sent you. So you may be aware what are the uh, areas we'll be covering in this lecture. So we will go to uh, case one here. Okay. This is a 55-year-old male with a rash in both legs and lower thighs. 
The patient was treated by a GP with clobetazol cream. And he continued this treatment for several months and then presenting to us with this kind of pustules around the previous lesion. So actually, we are, what we are seeing here is a case of pustular psoriasis. So uh, the, my guess is that the doctor must have thought of eczema rather than psoriasis and treated with clobetazole. And the patient continued clobetazole for a long period and on sudden withdrawal, there was pustulation. So one thing to, now let's see, uh, let's move on to a few important things about psoriasis. Psoriasis is common, right? About one to 3% of the population is affected. And there's a genetic predisposition uh, with autosomal dominant transmission, but there's a lot of influence from of environmental factors. And one thing to remember is it's a lifelong illness with remissions and relapses. So again, if you come to a diagnosis of psoriasis or if you meet a patient with psoriasis who has been diagnosed by somebody else, one question they would invariably ask you is, doctor, can we cure? this illness or they will ask doctor is it true that this illness is not curable in the sri lankan context the word curable is a uh, is a bit of a um, problem because they want diseases to be to go away without bothering them again ever but if we tell the patient, okay, yes, this is not curable, the, that is the moment the patient is going to lose faith in you and the system. That is why they go for alternative treatments in most of the skin diseases. So the way I would tackle this, I would say, okay, yes, we can treat this and make it disappear for the time being. But it may come back. I cannot tell you when, but it may come back. But every time it comes back, we should be able to uh, treat this and give you a complete clearance in most instances. That way, I'm not telling them that it's not curable, but I'm not telling them that it is curable also. Right? So that is a more acceptable version for the patient. So let's see what the clinical presentations are. There are red scaly papules which coalesce to form plaques and uh, there may be scalp lesions uh, that may be either scaling quite similar to dandruff or it may lead to uh, large plaques on the scalp, sometimes even matting of the hairs together. The important thing here is uh, the silvery white adherent uh, scale. And if you go on removing, there will be bleeding points underneath. So a few tips here. Uh, usually, psoriasis is a non-itchy condition, but scalp lesions may be itchy. And also, especially in the scalp lesions, if the patient says, doctor, when I, uh, when I uh, scratch my scalp, when I remove the scales, there is bleeding, right? It's, it's bleeding rather than losing. If it is bleeding rather than oozing in, in any of these lesions, it's more likely to be psoriasis than eczema or dandruff in the case of scalp. Uh, usually psoriasis is an extensor disease, but there, there can be flexor uh, involvement as well. Uh, we will look, rather than uh, looking at these descriptions, we will move on to the pictures. But remember, psoriasis is one condition where the cogna phenomenon is uh, seen. So cogna phenomenon means uh, the occurrence of lesions in areas where, where uh, trauma occurs. So uh, this could be a sudden, uh, an area with the, uh, any un inadvertent trauma, or it could be even be an area which is uh, under constant pressure, like uh, the under the bra straps, along the waist where you are wearing your belt, like that. Okay? So in those areas, the psoriasis may be more 
uh, prominently seen. So these are the plaques. I'm, I'm showing you several ways a plaque can present. So these are the, the picture number one. You see the typical plaques. Here you can see there are plaques. These are not occurring in a typical distribution. Actually, what happened in this boy is this is a child with uh, uh, some uh, developmental delay. He's a young man with developmental delay. And he used to sleep with his face pressed onto the pillow. So that pressure, that trauma uh, is, the, is what uh, precipitated the lesions on his chin and around the mouth because of the constant pressure. And here you can see the erythema is there, the scaling is there, but the center is clear. So in this case, you may even think of a tinea infection, right? So this is one way where you can go wrong. So then if you are not sure whether this is tinea or psoriasis, I mean, this is not a very common presentation of psoriasis, the annular lesions, but still, if you're not sure, uh, ask about itching. Tinea is extremely itchy, and most of the instances in tinea, there will be flexural lesions, and the flexural lesions will be scaly, similar to these, not like the psoriasis uh, flexural lesions, which I will show you later. And now here you can see this young man, again, he is not yet 20. Uh, he has extensive lesions in his body and these lesions are more erythematous than scaly. Again, when you see this sort of lesion, the more erythematous lesions where scaling is not very evident, you need to know that the lesions are not stable. They are unstable. So if you use any irritant substance on this, it doesn't have to be something like colta, even a kohombakola bath may precipitate an episode of exfoliation in this man. Right? So this boy needs very mild local applications and obviously he needs oral therapy to control his disease. And so these are four cases where there are plaques, but still you see the, the presentation is different from one another. When it comes to flexural psoriasis, you can see that the lesions are not scaly at all. They are shiny, macerated, very well demarcated, erythematous lesions. So uh, how do we differentiate this from a fungal infection? This one here doesn't have much scaling, but fungal infections will have a lot of scaling whether they occur in the flexures or somewhere else. This is another way uh, psoriasis can present. This is localized pharmoplantar pustulosis or localized pustular psoriasis, where you can see there are lesions here uh, which look a lot like uh, eczema. But if you look at the other side, there will be uh, nail involvement with swelling of the nail fold. So it may be quite difficult for someone who is not. Uh, an expert to make differentiate between pustular psoriasis and eczema. A few nail changes. These are the oil patches due to plaques occurring underneath the nails. Then you can see the nail dystrophy. You can see the uh, swelling of the nail folds or uh, paronychia. Okay. Another way psoriasis can present is as gutted psoriasis, where you get small lesions. Gutted psoriasis is usually associated with the streptococcal sore throat. And this will disappear after some time. Now a few uh, cases where you will see how difficult it may be to diagnose. Now you look at the ears of this. Now this is the uh, right ear, this is the left ear in the same patient. Uh, so you can see that there is a swelling in the left ear lobe where you would think of leprosy as your diagnosis. But look at the back of his ear. Now you see at the, uh, in the post auricular fold, there is an erythematous scaly rash. But the thing that clinches the diagnosis is here. 
at the back of the elbow, you get these typical plaques and a few more papular lesions. These are the things that I showed, told you in the beginning, scaly erythematous papules. Now, so these may uh, enlarge to form plaques later if we didn't start treatment in time. Okay. Again, look at this patient with the um, plaque in the scalp. Uh, coming out into the forehead. Again, this is a feature uh, which is in more in favor of psoriasis where you get uh, the, the scalp lesions extending onto the forehead, extending beyond the hairline. If it happens, you have to think more in terms of psoriasis than in subaric dermatitis. But this is the uh, lesion that clinches the diagnosis. You can see these well-defined erythematous less scaly plaques in the Axilla. One more case, this patient has some pustular lesions in the instep of the sole. Now, instep of the sole, when there are lesions, especially if it is unilateral, you think of uh, fungal infections rather than a, a psoriasis or an eczema. But look at these lesions. He had these very small papular lesions, hyperkeratotic with a beta scale. These were not typical, so I went for a biopsy which confirmed the diagnosis of psoriasis here. Now, you see the lesions can be very subtle. Now, this patient was actually referred to me uh, by one of my colleagues, a general practitioner, right? So, uh, the diagnosis was missed because it was not very typical of psoriasis. Okay? So, the points to be remembered in the management are that psoriasis may be associated with comorbidities. That's where a lot of you um, can play a very important role in the management. Think about diabetes, the risk of MI, uh, depression, obesity, hypercholesterolemia, all the non-communicable diseases, depression and obesity. And also there is an increased risk of malignancies as well in patients with psoriasis. So, even though most of our patients with psoriasis are being managed in skin clinics, you all uh, may come across patients who say, doctor, I had psoriasis. I'm not in treatment now and I have this problem. Anything, I mean, remember about the comorbidities and especially in your general practice, if you have been following up patients for a long period, if you know that they are having psoriasis, which is in remission now. Anyway, better to uh, monitor them for these non-communicable diseases, which are comorbidities or psoriasis. I'm not going to talk about psoriatic arthropathy here. So how do we treat? Uh, in like For your purposes, the most important thing is local applications. So remember, you have to be very careful when you're selecting your local applications. Initially, I, I showed you this uh, patient with unstable plaques. So someone like that, you should use the, the least potent steroid that you can prescribe for that patient. So always beware of using super potent steroids like probitazole. I think you would do better to leave probitazole to us rather than you know trying to uh, uh, play with probitazole and getting into trouble, right? Because it can precipitate pustular psoriasis on withdrawal other steroids, especially if they have been using it for a long period. So a simple guide is for the face, don't go beyond 1% hydrocortisone. For the body, it's either betamethasone or mometasone. If the lesions are very extensive, you can dilute the betamethasone in aqueous cream. Usually we dilute it in one in three. My, my easiest way of doing this is I ask them to buy two tubes of betamethasone cream and one pot of uh, aqueous cream, which is 100 grams. Take everything out, mix it and keep it safe and apply this whenever you need to apply Momentazone also can be used and there, there is one uh, brand of momentazone plus salicylic acid, uh, which is very good in limited disease. You may use uh, clobetazole for the palms and soles. Colta and salicylic acid, usually we use 3% salicylic acid and 6% colta in emulsifying ointment, which is useful for the body. And there are colta preparations which are useful for the scalp also. 
but remember, do not think of using Colta in a patient with unstable plaques, where erythema is more prominent than scaling. And also remember, Colta is messy. I mean, if you had psoriasis, you would think, look for other alternatives rather than trying to use Colta on yourself. Uh, coming to oral agents, methotrexate is the first line oral agent and which is actually still the, the gold standard in treatment. But you have to make sure that the patient has normal liver and renal function. Uh, I have seen many cases where patients with uh, moderate uh, renal impairment being treated with uh, methotrexate and going into methotrexate toxicity. If you have a patient uh, who is on methotrexate, either from the clinic or whether if you have started them on treatment, make sure that you monitor their liver function and the blood counts. It may be enough to uh, do a baseline renal function, but the liver and the blood counts have to be monitored every month. Uh, and also remember, you should know about methotrexate toxicity. This is this causes uh, uh, bone marrow suppression, where all three cell lines may be reduced. So you have to know about uh, the features of an aplastic anemia if you know if you are putting patients on methotrexate. Other treatment methods include phototherapy. Phototherapy is now available in almost all the uh, dermatology units, but Again, these days we have a problem of using phototherapy because of the uh, risk for, uh, I mean, uh, with the risk of uh, cross infection, we are now limiting the use of phototherapy machines. Cyclosporin can be used and biologics, but at the moment, biologics are used mostly in teaching units uh, in the government sector. So uh, I told you earlier also general practitioner's rule includes monitoring for comorbidities and also monitoring of uh, adverse effects due to therapy. So they may come to you with a problem because the clinic date is in two weeks time. So you should know about these things and how to counsel and what are the things to uh, where you should act fast. If you think a patient is having methotrexate toxicity, admit them immediately. So coming to case two, uh, a middle-aged man with a history of ulceration of the lips for several months. So the patient had been given oral gels uh, again and again. Later, the patient developed blisters on the chest and limbs, and this was treated with saframycin. So when the patient comes to the clinic, it was like this. So you see the ulceration of the lips, which is very bad. So uh, when you see this, you are sure that this cannot be just after ulceration or any other cause of oral ulcer. Can you see now here, you are seeing mostly ulcerated lesions. You don't see any blisters. That's because these are very flaccid superficial blisters which are broken and left low area. So when you see these, if you see only the skin lesions, you may not be able to come to a diagnosis that this is a blistering disorder. So the things, thing that gives away the diagnosis is the oral lesion. Usually in PEM figures, oral lesions come some uh, months before the uh, skin lesions appear. So the usual uh, sequence is oral lesions, plus or minus uh, eye or genital lesions, and then they start getting small uh, flaccid blisters. They may even be tense at the beginning, and then they become larger, and then they break out and uh, uh, ulcerate. So they may be small ulcers like this, or they may be larger like this. But remember, there are so many other things that cause blistering other than autoimmune blistering disorders. So uh, this is not, this doesn't give all the um, causes for blistering, just a few common things. I think probably the commonest are infections like herpes, uh, simplex and suster, bullous sympatigo, inflammatory tinea, insect bite reactions, eczema, drug reactions, and even sweat rashes. 
and vasculitis also may present like this. So these are far commoner than autoimmune blistering disorders. I'm not going to talk to you anything about congenital blistering uh, because of the time constraints. Okay, we will rush through a few pictures. Now you can see the unilateral dermatomal distribution of herpes zoster. In the history, remember, pain preceding the blisters has to be elicited. So most of the times the patients will get admitted with the pain. So it may be a chest pain, it may be a pain uh, resembling uh, a sciatica. So the pain is very important in diagnosing herpes zoster. The other important factor is the unilateral lesion. But you can see a few lesions which are crossing the midline also here. So this is herpes simplex. You would rarely see the uh, blisters. You will see the uh, row areas. Hand, foot and mouth disease. These are not exactly blisters. These are mostly small vesicles. Uh, they may occur on the uh, dorsal, dorsal aspect as well. And this, this may be sometimes difficult to differentiate from chickenpox also. Yeah. Bullet sympathigo, look at the picture, look at this picture. You rarely see the blisters, but you see this annular configuration where there is a little bit of a burnt appearance in the center. So the mother's history will also be like that. There was this red uh, lesion, then it spread out, leaving burns like le uh, lesions in the center. Uh, more common in children, but it can occur in adults as well, especially if they are immune compromised. Irritant contact dermatitis, these, these are, look at these bizarre presentations. Like now, now you see these are, these are very like as if linear, bizarre linear lesions with either pustules or a bit of uh, necrosis like what you see here. Usually these are due to uh, the patient, call, I mean, an insect coming into contact with the skin. Can you see the um, necrosis here and necrosis here? So what happens is the, uh, the person in their sleep feels the um, touch of this uh, insect and uh, with like uh, subconsciously brushes away the thing that is touching their uh, skin. So that is why you get these linear lesions. And this usually happens with these tiny insects, which are uh, like flocking around uh, lights, especially at night. Right? They are um, in some areas, they are called coltel manamalia. Okay. Eczema is another thing that causes blistering, uh, especially this is pomphalic eczema on the sides of the palms and sides of the fingers. There will be tense blisters and then itching and then uh, peeling off of the skin. And here again, you see infective eczema, uh, infected eczema showing blisters. Would you think of sweat rash if you saw this lady? Right? You see how big the lesions are. But this, this is the typical way miliaria crystallina presents, but very rarely you may see large lesions like these as well. I saw a lot of patients like this about three years ago when there was this uh, bout of very uh, hot, uh, humid climate. Uh, there were a lot of patients flocking to clinics with uh, sweat rashes. Okay. SLE sometimes can uh, present with vesicles and pustules and blisters. Papillotic area. You see, you can see even very tense lesions like these or even the, the smaller lesions like this. So this is, these are insect bite reactions. Uh, I don't have any skin lesions or Steven Johnson syndrome, so, but I'm sure that you know how to uh, diagnose Steven Johnson syndrome. These are called fixed drug eruptions, very dark blackish lesions, which occur again and again in the same site. And if the insult is repeated, you may get blistering, uh, especially with repeated insults. Cutaneous vasculitis, usually it will present like uh, non-blanching erythema, palpable purpura like this, but if it is very severe, they may present with 
hemorrhagic or uh, blistering lesions. Okay. Uh, coming to the autoimmune blistering, there are two types, epidermal bullet and subepidermal bullet. Uh, I am not going into all the details, but remember when there are epidermal bullet, they, they will lead to flaccid blisters, which will usually break, leaving ulceration. But if there are subepidermal bullet, uh, they will be tense and they are likely to remain as blisters. So you are likely to see the blisters even four or five days after the, erup the eruption has started. So there are several uh, conditions which may uh, present with the uh, epidermal bullet. The commonest uh, epidermal blistering disorder is pemphigus. The commonest subepidermal thing is bullous pemphigoid. And I'll show you a few pictures of linear IG, IgA disease also. The other ones are not very common. Right. So pemphigus, oral lesions, you saw these. And the blisters will be initially like this. These flaccid blisters, can you see them hanging down? So those are the flaccid blisters and then they will start ulcerating like this. And then leave a large ulcerated denuded area. So head and neck face lesions would occur like this. Or ulcerated lesions in the trunk and limbs, they tend to be more concentrated in flexural areas and they, that can become uh, extensive. Recently also one of my GP colleagues uh, called and asked whether I could uh, admit a patient with uh, extensive eczema. I was not very happy to admit. Then when I saw the patient, it was a uh, blistering disorder which has gone uh, undiagnosed. Coming to bullous pemphigoid, where you get tense blistering, uh, this is not a very good picture. I didn't have any recent ones, but can you see the tense blister here? Right? They, uh, I'll say they, they tend to uh, end up in row areas because these are very itchy. Right? And because they are itchy, they, the patient may break the blisters easily, even though they don't break spontaneously. Uh, and sometimes there may be an urticarial base, right? The, this picture doesn't show that, but if you see a patient, you may appreciate that. This is more common in the elderly, but uh, we have seen uh, bullous pemphigoid even in patients who are in their 30s and 40s also. So this is not only in elderly, uh, in case of Sri Lankans. So how do we manage pemphigus and pemphigoid? Both these conditions are best managed in hospital setting as in patients, unless it's very limited disease. So initially to start the treatment, we usually admit them. Steroids are the mainstay of therapy in both either high dose prednisolone or dexamethasone pulses. In a lot of patients, we use uh, to that uh, monthly dexamethasone pulse, we add cyclophosphamide also. If it is limited disease, topical steroids can be used. This is a con uh, condition where we use uh, super potent uh, topical steroids sometimes uh, in combination with uh, antibiotics, like uh, even clobetasol gentamicin combinations can be used if there is limited disease. And remember, supportive therapy is very important. The, the management of possible infection, keeping the patient comfortable, like when they have this extensive blistering they are very uncomfortable they cannot wear something uh, i mean any any garment is irritating sometimes they have to be kept just covered with the shape right so in those instances even air mattresses water mattresses all these things are important and when they have oral lesions maintaining adequate nutrition is also a challenge so most of these patients, they would do better in a hospital setting rather than being managed at home. So a GP can play a major role in monitoring for steroid adverse effects, right? Most of these patients are on steroids for a long, long period. Now, remember about 30, 40 years ago, uh, especially if you got uh, pemphigus vulgaris, it was like a death warrant. A lot of patients, majority of patients with pemphigus died. But with the uh, with uh, a lot of dermatologists putting them on high-dose steroids, 
plus the introduction of the dexamethasone cyclophosphamide pulses, the mortality due to pemphigus has come down, but now the mortality may be due to the uh, effects of these high dose steroids. So anyway, uh, patients with pemphigus and pemphigoid have to be monitored, have to be followed up very carefully. So again, uh, I mean, we can get together to do this. Uh, I'll just show you uh, a few pictures, a little, little thing about linear IgA disease, uh, because it's very, very fascinating, right? Uh, it can occur in children as well as in adults. When it occurs in children, it's called chronic bullous disease of childhood, uh, which is the commonest childhood blistering disorder, right? And here, the mainstay of treatment is Dapsone. Uh, and they respond very well to Dapsone. And uh, here, of course, uh, with the doses that we are using, side effects due to Dapsone are very rare. But still, remember, Dapsone can uh, give rise to hemolysis. It can give rise to hepatitis. And it can also give rise to agranulocytosis. I have not seen agranulocytosis at the doses we are using for uh, blistering disorders. But still, uh, I'll come to Dapson later when I'm talking to you about uh, leprosy. Anyway, management here is mainly with Dapson and topical steroids, right? So this is how you see a typical, very fascinating thing is like you get this burn-like center with these uh, peripheral tense blisters. This is called a rosette formation, right? So the blisters extend out uh, with the center being uh, kind of ulcerated or uh, necrotic. So this is called rosette formation and this is typical of linear IgA bullous dermatosis. It's the same in children. But in children, remember, uh, you may need to differentiate this from bullous sympatigo because bullous sympatigo is much commoner than Bullous, uh, CBDC or chronic bullous species of childhood. So both children and adults are being treated with Dapsone uh, and they can use topical steroids on these lesions, especially because these are tense blisters with, with uh, somewhat intact looking skin. The uh, patient may not feel so uncomfortable to use steroids on these lesions. So a few take home messages about blistering, remember, not every blister is due to an autoimmune bullous disease, so think of the common conditions first. Then, uh, if there is an extensive involvement of the body with mucosal lesions, think of autoimmune blistering. But again, remember, the same can happen with acute SLE also. Uh, if you see blisters and not sure of the diagnosis, and if you are uh, if your diagnosis is between an infection and uh, a blistering disorder, treat the infection first. If they are not getting better, think about other things, right? At that point, they may do well to be referred. Uh, I told you earlier also, don't use triple combinations, um, especially because this is very, very important because now when we have a patient with blistering in our clinics, uh, we need to come to a clinical diagnosis as quickly as possible because the, the confirmation is with the biopsy and immunofluorescence, direct immunofluorescence on uh, perilational skin. These take ages. A biopsy may take one week to one month, depending on where you do it. And uh, immunofluorescence is done only at MRI. So if we wait for these uh, reports to come to start the treatment, uh, the patient may deteriorate very badly. So it's very important that the dermatologist is able to come to a diagnosis as quickly as possible. So if you use steroids and mask the typical features of the lesion, you are actually hindering the diagnosis. So my advice is, if, you, if you're not sure of a uh, lesion with blisters, treat with either antifungal or anti, uh, antibiotic. If there's no response, get the patient to a dermatology clinic as quickly as possible. Case three, 
this young, uh, not young, middle-aged engineer. Uh, this is uh, this is not his picture actually. I didn't have a picture of his lesion. This was a little bit more scaly than this, and at the back of the elbow. And his complaint was, uh, doctor, when I'm driving, when I if I uh, try to you know rest my uh, right uh, elbow on the um, on the door. There's a very severe pain. That means there was some pain in the elbow, right? Uh, there were no other skin lesions and he was managed as psoriasis because this is a typical place for psoriasis, back of the elbow. Then he developed numbness at the fourth and fifth fingers of the right hand and then he was referred to us and we made a diagnosis of leprosy. Uh, before we go into anything else, I'll talk to you about this lesion at the back of the elbow because it's a very common uh, site for leprosy lesions to occur. Uh, and it's very unlikely for the patient to have noticed it because, I mean, just think uh, when was the last time you saw the back of your elbow. But the problem is uh, the lesions at the back of the elbow lie right on top of the ulna nerve. Therefore, if they are not detected early and if they are not treated, they may end up with ulna neuropathy, which may even be irreversible. So why is leprosy important to us? Leprosy is a chronic infection of the skin and peripheral nerves. Because of this peripheral nerve involvement only, leprosy is a problem. Otherwise, it won't be dif different from uh, just vitreous versicolor, right? Uh, remember, the mold of spread is respiratory, so you don't have to uh, have any fear about uh, touching the patient, right? You don't need gloves to touch a patient with leprosy unless you are worried about uh, COVID, right? Uh, last year, we had 1,700 plus patients and uh, new cases being reported uh, in 2020. Also, I think there were about 1,600. 40% of them are in the Western province, 10% are children below 15 years, and visible disability, that is either claw hand or ulceration or whatever, in 7%, this is due to late presentation. That's because only about 40% are started on treatment within six months of symptom onset. That means a large percentage are being missed at primary care level, right? Uh, about... 15 years ago, I did a small survey on patients that I saw in our NHS clinic. Um, and there we saw that about 60% of the patients had been to another doctor before coming to us where the diagnosis was missed. And the more infective forms of leprosy are being missed more often than the typical non-infective forms. So what are the clinical features? The hypopigmented anesthetic patch, the well-known and the commonest feature, you can see the, the, the light colored lesions, which are very small at the beginning. And this is the mother, this is the child. Both are having lesions on the arm. And can you see now the lesion is trying to give away pseudopodia and satellite lesions. Here, can you see there is a satellite lesion here? And right round the lesion, now the lesion is trying to expand. So that means the, the body's immune system is now not being able to contain the infection. Right Now the, the infection is trying to take over. Uh, sometimes there may not be uh, overt sensory loss. So in such instances, what you should do is like, say, when you are checking for sensation, you should do it in the normal skin first and then in the lesion. And if the patient can point out uh, and when you are checking for sensation, don't use pins or anything. Uh, we are using either toothpicks or a ballpoint pen or even uh, uh, like, say, think of an A4 sheet, take a small piece of that fold it in two and again fold it in two so that you have a point. That point can uh, serve as a tool to check for sensation, right? So whatever the tool that you are using to check for sensation, first check it in the normal looking skin and then in the lesion. And ask the patient to point out, don't ask, uh, can you feel it? 
the patient will always say yes i can feel it so ask the patient to point out and if the patient can point out where you are touching then do it in the lesion do it in the surrounding skin and ask the patient to compare is there a difference or do you feel both the same right so if there is a difference if there is less feeling in the lesion again it's likely to be uh, leprosy right remember because these lesions can be dry there will be less hair especially if it is occurring in the calf also where in the hair bearing area you will notice the less hairs uh, reduced or less sensation this is what i meant by a feeder nerve like you can see this hypopigmented large lesion here and you can see this cord like structure this is a uh, cutaneous nerve not one of the major nerve trunks but this patient can have a thick and dull nerve because it's in the arm right and even these two patients may have a thick and dull nerve because it's there in the arm right some more hypopigmented lesions and here you can see now this one is now breaking out giving away uh, a satellite lesion right uh, and when it occurs in the palm they may look more erythematous than hypopigmented but again you see in this young boy a lesion you may even have thought of eczema here right so uh, even the hypopigmented patch can present in so many ways i think i haven't included the picture but some hypopigmented patches are huge involving one half of the body itself i mean the trunk itself right and when it is a dark person like me i when they develop uh, leprosy lesions the lesions will be more copper colored than hypopigmented so the darker the patient the higher the chances of copper colored lesions and again you can see the lesion now now the disease is trying to spread out there are uh, satellite lesions in both these lesions right then they can have multiple hypopigmented patches which may resemble aluhang or pityriasis versicolor by now most of these lesions are symmetrically distributed you can see the symmetry here and there may not be any sensory impairment but they may have associated peripheral neuropathy in an instance like this if you think this could be pityriasis versicolor by all means treat the versicolor but let the patient come back to you in one month or six weeks and see whether the lesions have responded to treatment or whether they are persistent if they are persistent think of any other diagnosis than pityriasis versicolor and they you would do well to refer these patients to a skin clinic when the disease progresses more the sensory impairment in the lesions is not seen now the lesions are more numerous lesions are thicker now you can appreciate the fact that all these lesions are now raised from the skin and one very important factor here two very important factors are there when you come to these lesions these are uh, skin colored or erythematous lesions where you may even think of urticaria i have seen like this patient this lady had been treated for urticaria for months before she came to us so remember urticaria persists for less than 24 hours it's a transient thing and there will be severe itching and the lesions will disappear but there may be new lesions coming up later but these lesions have been there for ages the second thing is look at this look at even this what does this remind you of these remind you of ulunduvade or a donut right so when if you see this sort of lesion where there is central clearing there are skin colored or erythematous plaques with central clearing think of leprosy before everything else right all these patients are likely to have a peripheral neuropathy right so uh, a skin colored or erythematous skin lesions uh, persisting for a long time with the peripheral neuropathy or any neurological uh, symptoms think of leprosy uh, as one of your uh, first dds right leptomatous leprosy is typically uh, diagnosed when you have the leonine face as uh, you can see here this patient he was not 50 by, at this point 
uh, but you can see that there are no eyebrows, right? These eyebrows are completely gone. And you can see these nodular thickenings of the forehead. And you can see a little bit of uh, earlobe involvement here and a few nodules here in the chin. Apart from these, there were no skin lesions, I mean, no hypopigmented patches or anything suggestive of leprosy. But this is a typical case of lepromatous leprosy. So these are the features, diffuse thickening on the facial skin, yellow nodules. This is an extensive case of yellow nodules where the whole ear is thickened with nodularity. Uh, thickening of the eyebrows, as you see here. Uh, in this patient, it looks as if there is a collapse of the nasal bridge, but it's not there, you see here. This is another thing we are seeing in our patients, the, the papules in the chin. Even this gentleman is having papules in the chin. And these ones, even on the lips, these are packed with bacilli. If you do a bacillary index here, the maximum six plus may be seen in these patients. They may present with thickened peripheral nerves. Most of the times we see the great auricular nerve here great auricular nerve here, and there's another cervical nerve being thickened. You have a skin lesion here. The skin lesion here has been biopsy. And in this lady, you see the, the uh, radial cutaneous nerve. It's not the vein here, but this tiny, very subtle, uh, thickening, thickened cord-like structure is a radial cutaneous nerve. And ulnar nerve involvement is very commonly seen. Sometimes you may even see this. The other way they can present is with a nerve palsy. Commonest are ulnar claw and foot drop. Ulnar claws may uh, recover if you diagnose them early and treat, but foot drop is very, very difficult to uh, get a 100% uh, cure. This may resemble the mononeuritis multiplex or diabetes. Now, if you look at this hand, this is a young man. He was in his early 20s, if I remember correct. You can see that there is an established ulnar claw with small muscle wasting. Right? So this one now is beyond, the, uh, beyond recovery with medical treatment. Now this patient needs physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and most probably corrective surgery, right? So it's a, it's a crime to let them go to this point, right? So that's what we want to uh, avoid. So remember, I mean, because ulna claw, ulna involvement is the commonest, remember they may present with very subtle features. So if your patient says, doctor, I find it difficult to write uh, using a pen or I find it difficult to type because uh, the, 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 if I try to type with my fourth and fifth fingers, I feel that they are different. Or if they say, doctor, I find it difficult to feed myself. But katak kanagana kanna ban. And so that is because to do that, to eat our rice with our fingers, you need to bring in all five fingers like this. So if it is like this, you can't, you can't eat your rice with your fingers. So if a patient complains of that, or if they say, I find it difficult to hold my uh, cup because these fingers try to drip down like this, that is the uh, point where you have to look at the ulnar nerve and refer the patient, right? So if you detect early, that is... In 60 to 70 percent of patients, it's reversible if you detect early. Uh, it's, it, if it comes to this point, um, there's nothing much we can do to give them a 100 percent uh, normal functioning hand. Non-healing ulcers, trophic ulcers, you see she has lost her finger a long time ago. Right? But you can see these ulcers here, you can see the trophic ulcers here, you can see a trophic ulcer here, an auto-amputation of the, um, the second toe. Right? So when these things occur, they occur due to numbness of the palms and soles, due to peripheral neuropathy, which may be similar to diabetic ulcers, and especially if it is a relatively young person, 
whose blood sugar is normal, think of leprosy. Right? Uh, lepra reactions, I'm not going into a lot of detail, but remember if they come with this sort of very dramatic swelling, the swelling of the face, the swelling of the hands, these belong to the same patient. All neurological impairment, sudden neurological impairment, think of uh, lepra reactions. Uh, or the other type of reaction will be like this nodules, which resemble erythema uh, nodosum but they can occur everywhere on the body, not only on the shins. Uh, this type two reaction, the patients will present with multiple uh, subcutaneous nodules with fever and sometimes uh, systemic symptoms which resemble a, um, septicemia also. Right? How do we treat? I'm just showing you these facts because if the patient comes to you with this, you, you know what is wrong with the patient. Uh, in Sri Lanka, now almost 100% of the cases of leprosy are being managed by dermatologists. So all you have to do is suspect leprosy and do a referral. But you should know what these are. These, this is called the possible ciliary uh, leprosy treatment or in multi drug. We call it MDT or multi drug therapy. This is the PB or possible ciliary treatment. The green one is given to adults, the blue one is for children. Uh, the drugs given here are rifampicin, which is given once a month, and dapsone, which is given once daily. We give six packs of this to uh, PB patients. Uh, right? Uh, this is given to adults. This is given to children. This is for six months. And this is the multibacillary treatment, which is given to more infectious kind of patients. 12 packs of this. The red one is for adults. The brown one is for children. Uh, here we give monthly rifampicin and a high dose of clofazamine and a daily dose of dapsone and clofazamine. Clofazamine is at present being used only uh, for the treatment of leprosy. So a lot of you may not even have heard of the drug. Uh, this drug is a dye. Therefore, it can cause pigmentation. So a lot of patients, I mean, almost all the patients who are on these two packs, their skin complexion, the color changes. So they become sort of chocolate colored. And a lot of patients don't like this. Right. So what are the primary uh, care doctor's role in leprosy? First thing is suspect leprosy. Now, a lot of you think leprosy, uh, now we have eliminated leprosy, so, so it's, it doesn't come into a differential diagnosis. So I told you we see more than 1,500 cases every year. Uh, and at present, we are seeing less because of the breakdown in services. Uh, therefore, once uh, we sort of come to a somewhat normal uh, situation after COVID, we may see a surge. So you also may be able to help us by suspecting and referring. Uh, in this case, I'll just tell you one small story. Uh, about two, three weeks ago, a mother brought her 23-year-old son who had a lesion at the back of his elbow. She just noticed this. This man has been working overseas and came back recently and she just noticed and asked what this is. And when the boy said, I don't feel in this, he had said, look, son, this is leprosy. And if you get the treatment now, you are likely to uh, get cured completely. She saw this on Friday and by the next Tuesday, the boy was on treatment. Right? So this is the, the level of uh, suspicion that all of us should keep. Right? So if you have a suspicion, check for sensation, look at the nerves. Uh, I told you this. And if you suspect leprosy, refer to the nearest skin clinic. If the referral says uh, leprosy, they will be given priority even if they have waiting lists for other things.
While the patient is on treatment, be aware of adverse effects due to treatment, mostly Dapsone. Now, Dapsone uh, can cause a slight methemoglobinemia and a slight reduction in hemoglobin. So the patients are likely to have a lethargy. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they may not be able to tolerate Dapsone very well. That occurs in everybody. But if they have symptoms of anemia, about 10% of, of our patients who are on treatment for leprosy with Dapsone develop anemia, which is bad enough to stop treatment. Then jaundice or symptoms of hepatitis because this causes uh, uh, drug-induced hepatitis. Then fever, sore throat, lymphadenopathy, especially in the first two, three months of the therapy. The two dreaded things are agranulocytosis or Dapsone hypersensitivity. Both these can kill. Therefore, if you know a patient who has been on treatment for leprosy and coming to you with fever, do an urgent full blood count. Uh, if it is slightly less or even higher with a neutrophil leukocytosis, refer to the skin clinic, stop the treatment. My advice is if it is a patient who is on treatment for leprosy, coming to you with fever, with, uh, stop the treatment. Actually, uh, we are discussing about co-infection uh, with COVID and uh, leprosy, where actually we are advised to continue the treatment uh, in COVID-positive patients because both uh, Dapsone and Clofazamine can be beneficial in COVID. I mean, if you have a co-infection of COVID, of course, you may continue. But other cases where you are not sure of the cause for the fever, stop the treatment, stop the Dapsone. That's the most important thing. Just one tablet of Dapsone taken while the patient is symptomatic can make the difference between life and death. I lost one patient like that because he has continued treatment while his blood counts were low. That was not anybody's fault because the patient had done the test and he didn't know how to read the report. He was asymptomatic, so he took the tablet that night. And the next morning, he came with fever and uh, being symptomatic. We did everything possible within 24 hours of admission, but he died after seven days due to overwhelming sepsis. That was agranulocytosis. So... If one of your patients says, I'm on treatment for leprosy, doctor, and I have this high fever, stop the treatment. No, no harm done by stopping the treatment. And you may even save a life. Sometimes they may have severe vomiting and GORD symptoms, which may even lead to stopping of treatment. Right? And be aware of reactions, because if there's new neurological impairment, uh, in a patient who is on treatment for leprosy, refer them immediately. If we treat with steroids, we may be able to save the function of a limb. Again, like say, don't have this idea, ah, this is someone with leprosy, so they are likely, they, they should have numbness. No, don't think like that. They may have numbness in that particular skin lesion, but numbness anywhere else, which is of new onset, can be treated, can be reversed, right? And don't think of giving a bit of vitamin B co and sending the patient back. Just refer, right? Uh, and also remember, most of our patients with reactions, especially the type 2 reactions, are on long-term prednisolone. Therefore, they need monitoring for steroid side effects. Right? Last bit, case four, which is a very short one. Now, this 12-year-old boy who is from a very affluent family uh, had presented to a GP with this itchy rash in the thighs and back of hands for three weeks. It was worse at night. Uh, so, uh, can you all please mute yourselves? Uh, so, the patient... Didn't have any, any lesions in the typical places. He was treated with beta methasone cream several times. There was mild improvement on the itching. And then his parents also started developing an itchy rash. And by the time I saw this boy, he had itchy nodules in his penis and scrotum. Now, this is a case of scabies where the diagnosis was made late. This is because... I, I, I use the word affluent because a lot of people and some doctors also think 
uh, we are not a breed that can have uh, scabies, right? Scabies is supposed to be a the poor man's disease. No, I have seen doctors developing scabies. That is also, of course, a occupational hazard. But, uh, and oh, the word affluent I used for another reason, because this is a relatively clean child, right? Therefore, scabies in the clean person may not occur in the typical places. That is why the child had the lesions in the thighs, the, the, uh, the relatively lax skin on the thighs and the back of hands, right? There were no lesions to begin with in the, um, the web spaces, right? So we may miss the, the diagnosis. Actually, it was very difficult to convince the father that this was scabies, right? He was very angry. Okay, scabies is a highly contagious disease. Uh, a lot of people think uh, doctors, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of people think uh, that a lot of skin diseases are contagious, but out of them, scabies and only a very few uh, skin diseases are contagious. You can uh, touch any of these without a problem. Scabies is caused by sarcoptis scabii, which is a mite, a microscopic mite. You can see the picture here. It spreads in households and environment with high frequency of intimate personal contact. So um, even now, you may be able to see this in these uh, intermediate care centers, quarantine centers, right? Uh, because there are a large number of pa patients who are uh, using a limited toilet facility, limited facility, especially now. In the next two, three months, we may uh, begin to see some cases of scabies also. Right? The other thing is presence or, I mean, even the remand, the, the, the police could do is a good source of infection, right? This is very important. The mites lay two to three eggs per day and these eggs mature in about two weeks. Therefore, if you get one mite in your skin today, uh, you may start showing a lot of symptoms about a month later. That's what happened in that boy also. He had a few lesions which were misdiagnosed. Uh, and also remember these mites can survive in the environment for several days. So if they, they can survive on your clothes, they can survive on your bed linen, even on your toys. The clinical features, nocturnal itch is the, uh, the main feature. The primary lesions are burrows, vesicles, and papules. You are very unlikely to see them. Second lesions are excoriations. That is when you have been scratching, the, the top uh, layer is gone, then it's an excoriation. Pustules with second infection or nodules, especially in the genital area in uh, males. In case of infants, they may have palmar plantar lesions because they are palm, the palmar skin is quite lax. And they may also get head and neck involvement. And usually it's clustered within families. This is the typical distribution. You can see the areas where you can get it. And in females, around the nipple and the areola is another typical site. So these are the, the burrows, the, the nodular lesion, the papules. And you can see the excoriations and the pigmentation. Then this is another typical site for uh, scabies. Or if you're immunosuppressed, they, you may end up with uh, extensive lesions with crusting, which is called crusted scabies. This boy was on uh, treatment for an acute leukemia. So his immune suppression caused the scabies to spread like this. So patients like this have to be treated with uh, oral treatments like ivermectin. Okay. I chose this topic, scabies, because a lot of doctors forget how to advise their patients. Remember, all contacts should be treated. Everyone in the household, whether they're symptomatic or not, should be treated. Cleaning of the clothing that have come in contact with the infected person. So it's either boiling or uh, I mean, keeping them uh, covered in a plastic bag for seven days, especially in case of toys, soft toys. You can uh, 
either keep it out in the sun or keep them sealed in plastic bags for two weeks before you allow the child to use them. Uh, there may be persistent itching, so they may need antihistamines for up to two weeks. This is general advice. Coming to permethrin cream, again, remember for every uh, treatment that you're using, all skin surfaces below neck in adults or face downwards in uh, children, all skin surfaces should be treated. It's not only the lesions. Don't, you can't just escape by say, asking the doctor, my patient to have a bath and apply every night. No, it's not like that. Permethrin comes as a 30 gram tube, which is uh, adequate for a single application for an adult, normal sized adult. A heavy built adult may need a bigger, I mean, uh, one and a half tubes or so. So uh, this is a guide for you to uh, decide on the number of tubes needed for a household. Remember application on the hands and underneath the nails is very important. So what I tell the patient is have your dinner early, have your nails cut and apply. And after applying, don't wash your hands. Okay. And uh, I mean, this reapplying to any areas washed is important in case of, uh, especially in case of mothers who are feed, uh, breastfeeding. Because a lot of doctors don't like to give uh, treat mothers because this is uh, this is a poison and they are afraid. But you can do it if you explain it very well to the mother, saying you apply, you just feed the baby and then apply and every time you want to feed the baby at night wash your hands wash your breast with soap and water only the breast not the whole body and feed the baby and then reapply again right so the the number of hours of application for an adult is 12. for an infant eight to 12, about 10 hours is adequate and in case of infants, make sure that you cover their hands with something, especially if they are into thumb sucking. So you have to remember all these things, all these practical things. So the diagnosis of scabies takes about a minute. But uh, advising the patient takes at least five minutes. Okay, remember this. You can't do it in a hurry. And they have to repeat in uh, seven days later to kill the by the small ones coming out of the eggs that were remaining. So these principles are uh, valid for BB cream also, but there are some differences. BB cream has to be, I mean, the minimum time that you need to apply BB cream on your skin is 72 hours, but you can't do it uh, at one go. So we say every day, take a bath, apply leave for 24 hours if you want to have a bath again or wash yourself wash and reapply so it's a continuous application for three days or sometimes even five days bb cream can be used in pregnancy uh, the safest is sulfur ointment even though it's very messy the application principles are same as for bb cream so three to five days if it is a baby below two years, you can apply 3% sulfur, two to 12 years, 5%, and an adult, 10%. Uh, so sulfur is actually the safest uh, uh, anti-scabies uh, treatment. And when it comes to permethrin, we usually don't recommend it in neonates. Again, but if you remember the principles of, you know, infection, where it takes about one month for the infection to be established, a neonate is very unlikely to need treatment for scabies, right? So even if the mother is positive, I mean, if it is a, a mother who is about to give birth, best thing is to treat the mother rather than wait for the delivery, right? Okay, a little bit about pediculosis, uh, head lice. I don't think I need to tell you about the clinical features. Usually body lice are not seen in Sri Lanka. Uh, remember this, adult lice can survive outside the human body for about 10 days. These are the things that are important in uh, controlling the infection. 
right even eggs can live up to 3 weeks so your your comb oh, can be your source of infection yes these are okuna right so a dart lice is okuna uh, the eggs are the, the what we call nits or in singhala lady right okay and have you all seen anything like this in the eyelashes of children these tiny things which are there right so these are pubic lies occurring in the eyelashes if this happens you have to think about child abuse also right treatment permethrin this i i just use these uh, brand names because i wanted to tell you this at the moment the response to permethrin 1% is very low so the standard treatment uh, for head lice is permethrin 1% the response is very low uh, so we now actually we have come to uh, use 5% uh, permethrin lotion even for head lice remember it has to be applied on dry hair keep for 10 minutes and then you comb it and then only you wash it and repeat it one week later if it is very severe infection you may give cotrimoxazole 480 mg bd for 3 days but physical methods are very important wet combing egg manual extraction even hot air even even using your uh, hair dryer may be helpful in some instances if you have lice in the eyelids you can't use any of these uh, toxic substances so we try to suffocate the lice by putting a large blobs of aqueous cream on the eyelids three times a day for about 5 days so that you will try to suffocate the insect again format control is important that's why i told you about the 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 eggs being uh, live for about 3 weeks so cleaning the combs cleaning bed linen and and treating the whole family are important so you see there are a lot of things to explain to the patient um, when you diagnose i mean a case of uh, scabies or head lice that is why i thought it's important for everybody to know this and especially head lice is a problem for a lot of us mothers right when you have teenage children and uh, funny enough even during the lockdown where the girls are not going out even then i see a few cases i, I saw a few cases of uh, head lice bad enough for the mothers to bring them for treatment so you see it's not a very easy thing to control so i think that's the end of our presentation thank you so much for joining it's uh, good to see a lot of you all joining and uh, are there any questions madam yeah Uh, if we diagnose uh, leprosy in pregnancy, can we treat? Yes. It is. It is also multivascular and possible treatment. Sorry. Uh, so, if we diagnose leprosy in pregnancy, uh, yes, uh, we. That was uh, Doctor Supon, right? Yes. Uh, if we diagnose leprosy in pregnancy, uh, there is no contraindication to treat. You need to treat because a lot of women may develop an exacerbation after. Uh, the delivery so we treat them uh, both this uh, both this uh, all these tre uh, treatments that we use can be given during pregnancy only thing is you have to make sure that the mother mother is being followed up in the tertiary uh, unit for the delivery right so we treat during pregnancy we don't uh, delay until delivery there is one question can we fully cure vitiligo patches okay uh, guys you need to remember that uh, you need to remember that vitiligo is a autoimmune condition therefore vitiligo uh, you may be able to uh, get a complete repigmentation at one point but there is no preventing the lesions from coming back again okay so uh, again the same principle that i told you about leprosy also for vitiligo you may be able to complete uh, achieve complete repigmentation but the lesions may recur later right so i try to avoid the word cure when it comes to these diseases 
Right. Okay. Hello. There's another question. If there is a hyperpigmented lesion in the lateral side of a foot without itching, ulceration or scaling for more than one year in a 40-year-old female, what are the DDs? Uh, sometimes if, if it, is, it was an eczema, initially started with itching, then it has gone on for some time. Uh, a hyperkeratotic eczema may not be itchy. Uh, uh, this is not a very easy to uh, easy to answer question without seeing the lesion. Sometimes it could even be a um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. But I would say it, it's it's a bit of a tricky question, right? So, but I think still you need to uh, think about eczema and also psoriasis, especially because psoriasis, if the patient is dark, may not show the typical erythema. Madam, uh, could you please describe how common are the skin reactions with carbamazepine, sodium valproate, damaragine? What is the management? Right. Okay. Now, uh, skin reactions, the commonest uh, anti-epileptic to cause skin reactions is carbamazepine. Valproate is fairly safe in that respect. Right. With carbamazepine, there are two things that can happen. One is uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. Carbamazepine is probably the commonest drug causing uh, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome in Sri Lanka. But there's another thing, uh, dress syndrome, uh, that is uh, the skin rash and the hyperisonophilia syndrome, which also can occur about a month into treatment with uh, so basically my advice is if your patient has uh, carbamazepine develops any skin rash within about two months of synthetic therapy, stop the treatment. It could be either the skin syndrome or the dress syndrome where you get the, the uh, maculopathic rash, uh, lymphadenopathy, hyperisolophilia, uh, which also can be life-threatening. Uh, with sodium valproate, of course, uh, the, the chances are much less, uh, but you can develop uh, serious side effects due to any of the, especially the old generation uh, anti epileptics. Madam, can you describe the skin lesions related to COVID? Um, okay. Uh, one thing I need to tell you is. Uh, actually, we do see many skin lesions related to COVID in Sri Lankan patients. Uh, actually, uh, now, now I have been, uh, now, now you know that in the 247 helpline, we have answered the mother at the thousand calls, right? And our mother at consultants, as well as our uh, volunteer also. I think we have had only about and then it can be like lesions like chill like say uh, swelling pain, either tip of fingers or tip of toes. And then uh, they can have a uh, syndrome like Kawasaki, especially in the BC in children. These are not common. These are the things that have been described in COVID. But uh, I, this is not a complete answer because I have... Okay, done. ...about conditions. But I can say that most of the, the queries that came to us uh, during COVID time were uh, things... Not exactly directly due to COVID, but related to either the other the drugs or the quarantine or things like that. Madam, a uh, 40 year old female uh, with uh, more than one year duration, non itchy rash, no ulcer, only on emollient. What is the I, I think that is the case I, I uh, answered earlier, right? I said uh, the DD was a little bit difficult, but that it could be eczema or psoriasis. Uh, there is one question here. Do we have to treat hyperpigmented lesions in infants? 
Okay, in infants, when there are hypopigmented lesions, there are two things you need to determine. Sometimes they can have hypopigmented lesions because of problems in uh, pigmentation. I mean, these are um, congenital problems, which are there, like say, when you may have these linear lesions due to what we call pigmentary mosaicism. But, but if they have the hypopigmented lesions in infants, the first thing to think of is atopic eczema. So if it is atopic eczema, of course, it has to be treated, right? So if you, uh, and the other thing that can happen is if any of the family members who are looking after the baby is having necklaces versicolor, they can have hypopigmented lesions, especially in their faces. These lesions will be very tiny, pinpoint like lesions, especially even on the eyelids. So, uh, if that is there, if you see any contact also, best thing is to treat it with the uh, antifungal, something like ketoconazole cream for about a month. But if you think of uh, Treat with an emollient, don't rush into steroids, treat with an emollient, apply it twice daily, and if there is no response, uh, let the baby be advised a dermatologist. And there's another question, what is the pulse therapy for feminine figures, what is the duration? Uh, this is, uh, the duration is, depending on the severity of the disease, we give a uh, Every month, we need three pulse with dexamethasone and uh, IV cytoposomide. And we treat them, uh, especially if we decide on giving them cytoposomide, we give oral cytoposomide all throughout. We first treat with monthly pulses until there's complete remission and for another six months after complete remission. So this is a specialist decision. Uh, and uh, that needs month duration. So these days, there's a lot of uh, interruptions to uh, pulses in most of our patients, and we are trying to manage them with prednisolone rather than admitting them for monthly pulses. Yeah, I saw another question about uh, tinea infections. I didn't try to cover tinea infections because this has been covered some time back by one of my colleagues. Uh, just a few points. These days, tinea infections are tinea infections are quite common, right? And a lot of patients now uh, either go to a um, pharmacy or call a pharmacy and get down these triple combinations. Uh, remember, tinea infections at this point are sometimes not responsive to the the typical antifungals that we have been using like uh, uh, mycanazole and clotrimazole. So at the moment, we are resorting to things like uh, uh, terbinafine and even cyclopirox. Uh, but in the hospital practice, most of the times, uh, like when I was at home, Agama, I was using clotrimazole rather than mycanazole. And a lot of them need treatment with oral antifungals. Remember, uh, your favorite fluconazole, 150 milligram weekly, is not very effective against uh, dermatophyte infections. Therefore, they have to be treated with either itraconazole orally or terbinafine orally. The itraconazole dose is 100 milligrams twice daily for a minimum of two weeks. But most of our patients need it for four weeks or six weeks. So what I do is I will try to do a baseline liver function test, give them the treatment for two weeks, and then get them, get them down with a repeat uh, SGPT, and then assess the response and decide on how long they are going to uh, need the treatment. There's another question, madam, can you explain ethics of patient on carbamazepine developing SJS? Uh, can the uh, person who asked this question uh, just explain what you actually meant? Think uh, of is like a patient is started on carbamazepine because it's a life-saving drug for a condition uh, which can kill. Right, so carbamazepine is a good anti-epileptic drug. 
there's no reason why you should not give carbamazepine to somebody just fearing that they may develop SJs. But if the patient develops SJs, it just happened, right? Uh, so there is no, I mean, there's no reason for the person who prescribed to be afraid of you. But if you think this is a SJS, you have to first stop it immediately and get the patient admitted. If it is SJS, there's no point in trying to treat at home. Uh, the only place where you are doing something unethical is if you know that they have had, I mean, if you forget to ask about allergies and uh, prescribe carbamazepine again, forgetting about, I mean, without asking or forgetting about that allergy, then of course you are doing something unethical. I'm not sure what uh, you actually mean. Uh, so if you can type in or uh, just ask the question, I would be uh, very grateful. Uh, there are two other questions. Patient. What about grisofalvin for tenia? Uh, grisofalvin for tenia still can be used. Uh, some patients don't respond. Sometimes you may need to give it for a longer period, but I wouldn't say it's useless. It can be used. Uh, what can we give for malaria crystallina? But there's no need to give a lot of things. Uh, the thing is, they have a problem of sweating. Therefore, you, you have to keep the skin cool as much as possible. So uh, daily baths, no hot water. Uh, uh, loose cotton clothing. Uh, if you can use a fan or whatever to keep your skin clean, um, cool, that's that will be helpful. Uh, calamine lotion will be useful. Control the itching with antihistamines. And uh, sometimes uh, they may need a few days treatment with a mild steroid, like uh, something like flucinolone or desonide or something like that. Uh, and then there was another question, what are the drugs which can ex exacerbate psoriasis? Actually, we had a list of drugs which can exacerbate psoriasis. Actually, now they say the, the, the uh, relationship between psoriasis and most of these drugs is not very strong. But the drugs that, cannot, that are best avoided are things like uh, chloroquines, and then uh, beta blockers, those are the two well-known ones. And sometimes even lithium can exacerbate. But in the case of a person who is having either uh, someone with a, uh, a manic depressive uh, status where lithium may be life-saving, there is no contraindication to use lithium. You may use lithium and then control the psoriasis later. Uh, there's another question, terbinafine 250 milligram daily for three weeks, will it be enough for tenia? I would uh, use for a minimum of four weeks, assess and then uh, decide whether it needs to be uh, repeated. Is it 5% permethrin for scabies too? Yes. Uh, is type 1 and type 2 reaction occur even without uh, treatment in leprosy? Yes, sometimes they may present with the type 1 or type 2 reaction. That's why I showed you the features of uh, type 1, type 2 also. What's the best drug for tenia capitis? Isn't it prisofalvin? Yes, of course. Tenia capitis is caused due to different organisms. Right, it's not the 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 uh, or same organism that causes tenia corporis. So yes, the first line treatment for tenia capitis is bisophalvin. Actually, I didn't try to cover tenia in this lecture, right? Mm, if pregnant mother and lactating mothers present with tenia, is local application only or oral antifungal? Uh, we somehow try to uh, manage with local applications, but. Oral terbinafine can be given in pregnancy, especially during the second and third trimester. So if you have a pregnant mother with extensive tenia, you may treat, uh, try to control the infection before she delivers by using terbinafine. Uh, as far as I can remember, none of these is recommended in uh, breastfeeding mothers, none of the oral antifungals. Can you use 5% permethrin in child? Yes. Uh, I gave you the trade name of some application for head lice. 
<laughs> it was there in the lecture. I mean, you, you can use any of the, now, of course, you can use any of these permethrin 5% lotions that we use for uh, the, the scabies, right? Any other questions? Uh, drugs for refractory case uh, of SB. What is SB? Uh, how can we manage excessive sweating in palm sensors? A difficult question. Uh, because uh, the first thing is you need to exclude uh, causes, medical causes. So we usually do a, a thyroid function test and a blood sugar. Uh, most of the times that's normal. You have to explain to the, it, it usually occurs in uh, children, uh, young adults. So you have to explain to them the, about this and that it may go on for some time. At the moment, we don't have uh, any uh, very good local applications. There's one brand of aluminum chloride called uh, all dry lotion, but that's also not a very fantastic thing. If it is really, really bad, uh, certain uh, teaching units, they are doing uh, uh, Botox injections to the, uh, which lasts for about three months. So if you have a child who is uh, about to sit a major exam or something like that, uh, you may uh, try to uh, get this done at least as a temporary measure, a Botox injection uh, at the wrist. Uh, will be able to control the itching, um, sorry, the sweating for about three months. If Dapsone allergy one stop treatment, what about continuing drugs for leprosy? Uh, it depends on uh, what, what, your, what type of leprosy it is. If it is someone with uh, who has been on Dapsone and uh, Rifampicin, we replace Rifampicin, uh, sorry, Dapsone with Trophosamine. Uh, if it is someone who has been on a three drug card, uh, sometimes we just continue the two drugs or else we add something like ofloxacin. Mm. For scatotiligo, is there any special treatment? You can use the steroid lotions. There are lotions for, I think, almost all steroids now. There's a momentosone lotion, metamethasone lotion, clobetasone lotion. So depending on how bad it is, you can uh, decide on a clobetasone lotion. Can you repeat what the instruction we should give applying permethrin to head lice? Permethrin to head lice. Uh, you have to apply it on uh, dry hair um, and apply uh, all along. I mean, take the lotion into your hands, apply uh, to the whole, uh, I mean, along, along the hairs you have to apply and keep it for 10, uh, 10 minutes. This is for uh, either 1% permethrin cream or uh, the 5%, right? right? And, and uh, you, you have to comb. And, and remove the, the, uh, the dead and dying, dying lice and then wash with shampoo. Hair loss, of course, is, I don't think, uh, is something that we can uh, tackle in uh, this session because it's, a, it, it's not an easy thing to, you know, tackle. It's, it's not just uh, giving a vitamin and escaping. So you need to uh, get a good history. Just, just the tips take a good history. Sometimes it's just hair loss, sometimes it's breakage of hair, sometimes it's just thinning of hair, not a loss. Remember both males and females can develop bold patches uh, on the top of their heads. Uh, so in that case, you have to think of hormonal relationship, right? Uh, and look for common causes for hair loss. So better to do a thyroid function test, look at anemia, things like that. So if you can exclude everything, you may give uh, multivitamins, but advise them about a good diet. Uh, say that uh, hair loss is not something that can be tackled within a week or month. It takes some time for the hair to grow back. Uh, stop, uh, stop worrying about these things. Uh, Right, and actually, uh, there is no one cure that fits all for uh, hair loss. Uh, is there a place for carbamazepine in pruritus? Uh, it's like this: we 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 try to uh, avoid carbamazepine in things like that, but of course, carbamazepine has a role to play in neuropathic pain, which may present like pruritus.
right so we 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 there may be a place but most of the times we try to avoid carbon mesopene in instances like uh, Yes, I think there are a lot of questions which are not related to what we discussed also. So, um, would now that we have gone for almost one and a half hours, would you all mind uh, emailing your questions to GMU so that uh, I can send you uh, answers to your questions? There was, there was one question asking about cutaneous vasculitis. Again, it's a big uh, topic. I think I there's going to be another discussion in uh, next, next month. month. Uh, the first few months. Next month. So, so this is something that I can suggest to my colleagues to do. So, so again, again it's not you uh, there are areas which you would like to be covered. covered. Can you all uh, let the GMOA know so that uh, the next speaker can uh, choose from those topics? Uh, new treatment options. So this is the last last answer I'm going to give. New treatment options for persisting dandruff. Uh, there are no very new ones. We, uh, even the cyclopirox shampoo we used to have is not available now as far as I know. Uh, but we can use uh, ketoconazole, we can use, uh, if it is very resistant, we can use quota shampoos, but for a short period only. Uh, if it is persisting dandruff, you need to exclude psoriasis also. So better to get them seen by an expert. Uh, sometimes, even if it is dandruff, uh, the combination of the, 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 the diabet, uh, calcipotrial plus beta uh, can be used to uh, achieve a control in uh, very extensive uh, dandruff. Okay, I think uh, that's all we can accommodate. Any other questions that were not answered, and if you have any any questions uh, that you think are pressing, please uh, be kind enough to email. Right? Thank you so much, and and and, and it was very thank good to have, have such an interactive session. Uh, thank, thank you so, so much, much. And, and also thank you, thank you for, for giving us this opportunity. opportunity. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, for your informative lecture. Uh, behalf of Groundwell Medical Officers Association and uh, Society for Health Research and Innovation. We are very thankful to you, madam. Uh, we will check all your questions and uh, we will email the answers to you all. Please send us your feedbacks to the chat box and fill the e-certificate form. Uh, we are we sent to the chat box here. Thank you very much. <laughs>